Zani, it's wonderful to get to spend some time with you. You've been thinking a lot and seeing the world react to this interesting AI moment. What are you seeing? What, how are you thinking about it? Well, James, thank you for having me. Um, it is an AI moment. You're quite right. You know, AI is something we've been focused on for a while because the economist's job, as you know, is to, to really try and join the dots between what's going on in business, economics, you know, foreign policy, science, technology. So I have a fantastic group of science writers who've been writing about this technology for a while. One of the things that I'm always struck by with the advent of AI is because it's surprising to me that many people don't realize they've been using AI. In search uses AI. Search, Google Maps, Google Translate. I'm, I'm actually always surprised by the number of people who don't think Google Translate is AI, just because they've become so used I think to it. It's, it's the generative aspect of the LLMs. It's that you put in a prompt and then this stuff appears. Right. I think that's what seems different to people. It's, my God, this is like magic. It's also, you know, once you get used to a technology, you don't think of it as being a scary technology. How much of it do you think has to do with the fact that this is the first time people are directly interacting with something like generative AI? Because if I think about the last 15 months, we've also had some other remarkable things happen in AI. AlphaFold, understanding of all proteins known to science. These are big, profound innovations, but they're less directly experienced by the public. So how much of it do you think has to do with that? I think that's had a huge that? difference. And I think, I mean, it's something that, that you're much better placed than I am to, to think about, because it must have been a, quite a big shock for you guys. If I was sitting where you're sitting, I would be thinking, why the heck is everyone so excited about this? We've been doing this stuff for years. We've had these models. We've had models within Google, right. DeepMind. And now suddenly the world's very excited because they've had access and lots of people have played with it. But I think it does, to your point, show how incredible the impact is when suddenly hundreds of millions of people have experienced something. Uh, the same thing, you know, it happens with a movie, right? It's a collective experience. It is at some point going to fundamentally change the world. And the question with all new innovation is how quickly. And I think probably it is little slower than we expect in this hype moment and more profound and dramatic in the long run. But, but our job in journalism is to try and explain this, this, what's going on, and to explain what it means for our readers. But if you look at the history of innovation, in the short term, it does take longer than you think to diffuse. And, and this technology is immensely powerful. It will transform lots of industries. But it's not necessarily going to transform every industry immediately. And one, one statistic that sticks to mind is the invention of the tractor. The tractor, it's not a general purpose technology, but it's a technology which fundamentally changed agriculture, right? right. You, you hugely increased productivity. In 1920, 4% of American farms had a tractor. You'd think because it was so much productivity enhancing, it would diffuse rapidly. In 1950, right. still less than half. It takes a while for technology to diffuse. Machine learning, which now seems so yesterday, but right. just a few years ago was the cutting edge. Y you tell me, but I think it's something like one and a half percent of American firms use machine learning. So it just takes a long time for this stuff to diffuse, which is why we'll have no doubt the AI version of Solo's paradox. You know, you can see computers everywhere except in the productivity oh, this, this. But I want to come back, Zani, to this question of what are the exciting possibilities you see? And then I also want to discuss your sense of what the concerns are that people have. Well, why don't I answer that with respect to to, to, to The Economist and to journalism. Because, you know, on the one hand, we're describing the phenomenon and we're trying to you know, help our readers understand it. On the other hand, we are thinking very hard about what does this mean for us and what does it mean for our journalism. And as you know, there's quite a lot of concern both about the impact of generative AI on the kind of future of journalism, both in terms of the potential for fake news, but also if you can just get a, a model to write copy, why do you need journalists? And so we've, we've sort of thought this through. And I am... Genuine, I say this to all my colleagues, I'm very upbeat, very excited about the possibilities. I think, as with every industry, there are incredible opportunities for this to improve our productivity and to, to be a real tool for journalists. We have a very strong data journalism team. Then there are another bunch of colleagues who are wonderful journalists but don't have those data science skills. It's going to be an incredible opportunity that people can interact with data who are not data scientists. Right. And that's not far away. Then there are things like, you know, translation. As you say, people don't think of it as being AI. It is AI. You know, when you can, with confidence, read The Economist in hundreds of languages. And so the third bucket is, and this is the sort of most far-out thinking, in a world where, you know, maybe 
my AI interacts with your AI, AI and instantly gets the news and you know, you're hearing about, the, I'm gonna get some daily feed automatically right. produced by my AI. It may be that in future there'll be some right. bot that right. helps deliver it, right. but the insights and the thinking from a bunch of smart people who talk to people who are experts in their field, who are right. experts in their field, drawing together the dots. I think right. that will be the same. There will be a premium for human interaction and for the insight that you get from humans. And people didn't stop playing chess just because computers became better at playing chess. People right. want to, I think people want to know what our very smart defense editor thinks about the war in Ukraine. People want to know, how, and we need to find a way to translate that in the new world. Yeah, no, in fact, the, the, the world of game playing is fascinating because one of the things that these algorithms have actually enabled us to do, at least chess players, even Go players, is to go where traditionally told them not to go there. So it's fascinating when you speak to Go players who will say, well, we always trained that that's a bad move. So they, there's a whole space that they never explored because they were told it's a bad move. But because they've seen these algorithms go there, it's actually almost fueled their creativity. Yeah. Uh, the point you said earlier also about your journalists who are not good, great data scientists, we're actually seeing that with people at Google and other places. So the people who have an idea for a program, but they never learn to code. They can now do So it. they can now just yeah. describe the idea. In fact, we've even had mathematicians who are very good mathematicians, uh, but if never are not coders. So they can now generate the code. So I think the, the possibility of giving people access to skills that they didn't have is extraordinary. Is extraordinary. And, and the ones who can code are just much faster. I think that's, that side is fantastic. Now there is, there, there are concerns and risks in the media. I mean, one is the question of copyright and we are going to be very focused on that. Where, right. you know, if you suck all of the data that, you know, we collectively produce and there's no compensation, then that's a problem for the media industry. Right. But more broadly and more fundamentally, I think there's the challenge that of disinformation, misinformation, deep fakes. And I think this is going to come upon us very fast. You know, next year is 2024 is a year in which three billion people in the world will vote. Um, there are elections in some That's 12 countries. That's a lot of elections. A lot of elections, a lot of big countries, India, Indonesia, uh, the UK, but the US massively. The potential damage that can be done in quite short order by the capabilities that are available today. It doesn't need no, more powerful I mean, AI. Well, well, one of the things that we're, we're deeply concerned about and also focused on is this question of misuse in one form or another. And misinformation is one version of misuse. There's other categories. But even on the misinformation part, uh, the possibilities are very, very concerning. Uh, but it's also the, why, the reason why we're trying to research and innovate on how to address that. But it's one of those collective action questions, which is how do we get everybody to do that? If your standard of success is that everybody does it, then it's just not going to happen. But I think if you, if you have people at the, at the cutting edge doing it, then you can start becoming trusted brands with trusted you know, values and so forth. And that's at right. least a step forward from where we are now. Oh, it's, it's, it's a step forward. But I think even that work is still going on. So for example, uh, we've made a lot of progress on watermarking images. It's much harder to watermark text because you can cut and paste it. So That's true, but te interestingly, <laughs> text Text was there in the last election. Text is, I think, not the big differentiator. The, I mean, deep fakes were there in the last election, but they were very bad, and you could really tell. I think right. that's the area where a sort of so much progress has happened yes. in the last few years. And so that, for me, is the one where I worry we're in a country where there's low trust. Even if you, you know, if you just see a video, there's a fake video, enough people see it and for enough times, it just shapes this perceptions. Really, this is a very active area of yeah. research, the question of how do we avoid these issues of use and misuse of these capabilities by anywhere from political actors to criminals to, you know, all the way up to, to rogue actors and governments. That's right? the, the tension that is at the heart of this, because on the one hand, you need to have rapid diffusion of this technology to get the productivity benefits to get the really dramatic changes that this could provide. And I think sometimes we do spend so much time worrying about the downsides. We don't talk enough about the fact that this really could, you know, change our capabilities for dealing with climate change. It, in medical research, it's already had okay. tremendous opportunities. It could be huge opportunities. On the other hand, if you do that and you have mass rapid adoption right. and you have rapid proliferation of these models, and we haven't talked about this yet, but if you have now the open source AI models, proliferating and getting more powerful, then it becomes very hard to 
control for these bad actors? The open source question is, is an interesting one, an important one, because on the one hand, a lot of innovation in the, throughout the whole internet era and period has benefited from open source. Uh, tinkerers working with the algorithms and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the software code. Look at Android. Android is an open yeah. source system. It's benefited enormously from being accessible to everybody and any innovator and tinkerer and so forth. So we, you do want that because it democratizes access, makes markets competitive and vibrant and all the rest of it. But at the same time, as these systems become more capable, there's a question of how do we want to think about access to more capable systems? I think that's the and, and how do you, as one of you know the the, the most capable of the of the models, you've, you've right. joined up with other leading model yes. um, providers to start thinking about this. And that's why I think we need to solve for diffusion because that's how we get the benefits collectively, economically, democratically, and all the rest of it. But I think there has to be some way to make sure that anybody large, small, whoever, who's b building very capable systems, uh, makes them available for testing, for benchmarking, for evaluation. Uh, I think we, we all have to do that. And that doesn't need to be a closed systems. I think we all should do that. And that can still leave the market open and competitive and vibrant. How do we make sure this gets diffused and adopted enough? Uh, across industries and sectors. So I think it's a really good question. You know, do you remember that study that was produced, the Oxford study about the impact of automation? Yeah. All jobs by... Yeah, 47% of all jobs would be, you know, wiped out by automation by 2030. Something, I mean, I may have the date right. slightly wrong, but broadly. And we now have the lowest unemployment rates, you know, in half a century. I don't believe there is a finite amount of jobs. I think the new technology spawns new jobs, new technology changes jobs. jobs, and new technology will, of course, replace some jobs. jobs. And one of my favorite statistics is that, you know, there were great worries about the, f the future of bank teller jobs when the ATM was invented. And as you know, there are more That's and more people working in banks. Exactly. I'm pretty sure I can see in the next sort of year, two, three, how it's going to impact journalism. And I think it's going to change jobs, some, but I think it's going to be a huge tool. In fact, the, the, the history of this, I mean, in fact, I remember back in the 90s doing some work with uh, the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics in the US. And the so the BLS tracks about 800 occupation categories. Guess what the fastest occupation category was and has always been every 10 year period? I don't know, office work? No. Other. 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 Other because right. what happened is every t any period when they're counting, so the, there's roughly 820 occupation categories, they always have another category. This is a, these are jobs that they haven't classified yet because they've That's just great, showed up on the, the new scene. Ones that turn they up. just showed up on the scene. So if you had looked in 1995, web designer was in other, it didn't exist. And now it's web designer as now a category. Now it's web designer as a category. Prompt engineer prompt will Prompt engineer is probably, way. right now, if you look at the BLS data, there's nothing called prompt engineer in there. It's probably lumped with other. I'm pretty sure that <laughs> will happen too. I, I guess I've got but, but two, two notes of caution. Right. Um, one is that you, know, you and I watched the whole debate about trade and trade's impact on jobs. Um, and in some ways, it's not dissimilar because there was, you know, some jobs went overseas, but overall the benefits were there. But government didn't do a terribly good job at both compensating the losers, but more importantly, in giving them and providing them with the skills and opportunity to retrain. To do the transition. And I, th I think that this time around, my hope is that we kind of learn that lesson and we think much more creatively about what is it that those, and there will be some jobs that are displaced. There will be. What are the kind of skills and retraining? And this, this mantra that you know, we've been writing about, that I firmly believe in, about the need for lifelong learning. You know, can we at last actually get some of these things in right, place? Right. The notion that you are going to, you know, in the first 20 years of your life, get the education that you need, and then off you go, is increasingly insane. It, oh, it's, totally, it's totally outdated. But, but, but you know, one, one of the things I'm reminded of, just looking at the history of this, um, you remember the solo paradox. Yes. But I think there's some instructive lessons to learn. At the time, I remember being involved, actually working with Bob Solo, looking at exactly what happened. And one of the key insights from the time was, well, of course, you could see computers everywhere. The use of them in the large sectors in the economy was very, very low. Back to your adoption Absolutely, that gets back to the tractors Right, argument. it's the tractors yeah. problem. The other problem was also that even where computers were showing up in industries, the reorganizations of activities and tasks to take advantage of the technology was very, very slow. So it's only when those things happened, adoption, 
and the retooling, if you like, of processes and activities, that's when the power in large sectors of the economy, yeah. wholesale, retail, etc., that's when the yeah, start to show and up. It's interesting that some countries are much better at enabling the diffusion of technology right. and other countries are much worse. And I think that that comes down actually to government. And, and in fact, it, it may well be even more important this time around how governments act in the face of AI, what their attitudes are, whether they are encouraging the transformation. You know, governments, as you know, are the great repositories of data. But if we're going to have, you know, fundamental medical breakthroughs, breakthroughs right? from this, we're going to need we're going to need to make use of massive amounts of healthcare data that is that governments have and, and need to embrace the use of these models. I think any regulatory approach, in my mind, has to take has to do both things. How do we enable the wonderful things that we need to have happen, but at the same time address the risks? I think all too often, at least some governments are taking a view of focusing on the risks and assuming a way that the, the possibilities, if they, if, they, if they acknowledge them at all, will happen by themselves. I don't think they will. Uh, we're seeing this in investments in science, in agriculture, in health, in, in all these other fields, and also even public benefits. I mean, we're doing a lot, for example, in things like flood forecasting. All these are societal public benefits. I don't think all those things happen by themselves. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there has to be a focus on I mean, both. One of the advantages of this big public realization is that I think it's this is all on politicians' radar screens suddenly, in and a way early. that they're and early, and, and early. they're focusing on it. And it, it doesn't mean that governments will do things right, but I think there is much, much greater attention and probably education of politicians is going faster than it might otherwise would. And in the end, I suspect that we are going to get all of the benefits of AI without some downside. I think right. we should be clear about this. There will be things that go wrong. And that in response to that is when regulation is tweaked, improved, sorted out. Right. The fact that leaders, both governments and the private sector, I think are thinking about these things early, I think will, you know, increases the odds that hopefully we'll get this, we'll get this right. Uh, I, no, I agree with that. About. And I'm, I'm very much in the, right. in the first camp. I'm incredibly excited about the potential of this technology, both, you know, for the rest of my lifetime and my kids. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very optimistic about what it means for The Economist. But the economist and the economy? Certainly the economist, and I hope the economy too. I mean, if we, look, we could mess it up. Certainly, I, I think if you, if you sort of put your hands up and, and, and the Luddites about it and say, oh, this is all much too scary, we're having nothing to do with it, then I think you're in trouble. I think it, you, it requires understanding, it requires looking into it, it requires experimenting. Right. It's, you know, as with any innovation, there's some, there's some scariness and risk about it, but it is fundamentally... I think something that will enable us to become much more productive as a society and to really be able to deal with some of these very, very tough, tough challenges, whether it's curing diseases, Jesus. whether it's dealing with climate change. It's unbelievable opportunities. Right. And you know, we haven't even talked about this, but we face a, a major demographic crunch in the world. You yes. know, we have fertility rates have gone right down. We have how, you know, for a long time, we've been worrying about how we would you know, be able to pay for an aging society, lots of people living longer, how on earth were we going to do this? Actually, AI is going to be incredibly helpful in doing that. And the productivity improvements are going to be incredibly helpful in generating the wealth that will enable that to happen. So there are huge upsides. We just have to do our very, very best to limit the downsides. With that in mind, here's a thought experiment for you. Uh, let's just imagine it's now 2050. And we're, the year 2050, we're looking back. We're looking back. And at that point, when we look back, the world is wonderfully happy that AI happened. What happened? What did, the, what did we get right? What opportunities did we realize? What risks did we address? So what happened to enable us to at least to get to 2050 and be wonderfully happy? So 2050, um, we are going to have hopefully found ways to limit the damage of climate change and to, you know, start reducing carbon concentrations. We're going to have had tremendous medical breakthroughs. Uh, society is going to be very, it's going to be very different. To have got there, we have to manage the, uh, the changes that come from this, and they will be profound, and that's, that's not going to be necessarily that easy. And we will have found a way to do that. And I think we will have found a way to think about what the role of the government is uh, and the relationship between markets and governments hmm. in a very different kind of economy. All elements of life may be quite different, but we will have found a way 
to maintain a sense of community, of society, and of a one where like our basic sense of humanity right. is strengthened. Um, and AI is no longer a scary thing that threatens humanity, but it's a tool that makes it easier for humanity to achieve its goals. Wow, I like that. I like that. What about you? I'm, yeah. Yeah, so, so the way I would think about it is in 2050, uh, what will have gone right? Um, a few things. First, I think we'll have actually improved the capabilities of AI so that it can actually solve the problems we want to solve. So hopefully we'll make it capable enough to solve the issues and opportunities we care about as humanity. I also hope that we'll have found a way to improve just the performance issues, safety, performance, toxicity, bias. Let me, let me mention one other thing that I think will be important for us to have got right, which is something I worry a lot about, is making sure that everybody benefits from the incredible bounty that will come to us. I'm actually quite convinced from a productivity standpoint, solving health, solving all these issues, well, I think we'll actually get there. I'm very optimistic about that. But it's not automatic that everybody will be able to benefit from that bounty. You're going to have to think very, very differently about exactly ensuring right. that the benefits are broadly and widely, not just within countries, but between, between countries. Between countries. I'll add one other thing is, but what does it mean to be a critical thinking human being in an age of AI, when in fact these systems can write essays, can argue, can rationalize, etc.? When you get used to the technology, you're never, no longer scared by it. We won't think of it as being so fundamentally different in 2050. It'll be per perfectly normal that you and I may have a conversation and our respective AIs, maybe they're prompting us, we'll all have a conversation. And they'll continue the conversation after we're done because we're out of time. So we're going to have to stop. So maybe our AIs will continue the conversation and catch us up later.